Today, I wanna to talk about how to make your very own mead recipe at home. So let's get started. So what do I mean by making your own recipe? Well, I literally mean you designing it, saying, well, I wanna make a, this fruit mead with this spice, with this oak, and yada yada. Like, totally curating the recipe. As opposed to uh, maybe finding one online, which as someone who publishes all my recipes, I always endorse you to try my recipes, or anyone else's for that matter, but you could take one you find online or in a book, you could also just willy-nilly throw some things in and see what happens. However, my goal today is to walk through some uh, simple concepts that are step-by-step -step on how to design a mead recipe with, an in with some intentionality and hope that it will turn out great and repeatable. So I'm going to be referencing some notes, and these notes are available to you. They're in the description in a link. You can download them. They're free. Alongside these notes, I'm also uh, tried to partner a mead making flow chart, which has a lot of information. There will be that as well in PDF form if you'd like to download that. And if you would like to get a poster version of it, you know, I'll show a little picture of it right here. Um, I'll put some links as well where you can get a poster and purchase it. The PDF is free, of course. These notes are free, but the poster has to cost some because it cost me money to print slash ship to you. So I've broken this up into, it's gonna sound like a lot, but 11 parts or questions you're gonna ask yourself before you start the mead you're gonna make. Let's say you are getting ambitious and you say, I wanna try a new mead recipe. I've made all of these ones I found online and it's time for me to go ahead and make my own. Here's where you start. The first question I would recommend you ask yourself is, what ABV mead are you going for with this? What alcohol by volume? Do you want it to be a 5%? Do you want it to be 14? Where does it fall? Now, lower ABV meads are often called hydromels. They're 7.5% ABV and lower. The standard strength is about 7.5 to 14%, and sack strength is 14% or above. Now, one important factor here is you do have to, depending on which style you're making, do some different steps to get it to be its best. For example, hydromels being lower ABV often need some help when it comes to like the mouthfeel or the body of it because they're sometimes watery. So we talk about carbonation, extra tannin, things like that. So what ABV do we want our mead? I'm not gonna spell out a recipe in this video. I'm just gonna talk you through the process and maybe you can make your own recipe as we're going along. So question one, what ABV do we want? Question two, is this gonna be a traditional mead or is this going to be some other kind? Is it gonna be a fruit mead or melomel as we call it? Is it spiced? Is it a braggot? Is it a boche? There's a whole list of different styles of mead that I'm gonna reference and you can make any of these. Most importantly, is this gonna be a traditional? If it's a traditional, you wanna really consider your honey. It is so important to get high quality honey for traditional meads because it's the it's the main flavor. That's like all you have in a traditional mead is that quality honey. So get whatever it is, high quality honey for traditionals. If you're making a fruited mead, it's also good to get high quality honey. However, because fruit is often a predominant flavor, the honey kind of has a friend to lean on, meaning that it doesn't have to be as apparent. We want it to taste like honey. We want all mead to have a honey taste to it, but the fruit balances that. So you don't always have to use like the tip top highest honey quality for your fruited meads or spiced meads, sometimes like that. Now, one little thing I added in here in my notes is talking about water chemistry. It's not really in, in relationship to the traditional mead, but it is in relationship to the, the recipe you're creating so far. So your water is really important. If you would not drink your tap water you have at your house for yourself, don't use it in your mead. Go ahead and go to the store. Get yourself a whole, you know, whatever spring water gallon you can find or some other alternative if you can. But your tap water at home can work totally fine if you would drink it yourself. If you wouldn't drink it yourself, then don't do it. So here's where this starts to break down. Because as you saw, it says in question two, you know, I'm, am I making a traditional? If you're making a traditional, you can skip 
a couple of these questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about them, but obviously if you are following this exact questionnaire, you could skip around as you need. So let's pretend, or let's say, that we're making a spiced mead. Question three is, if making a fruit or spiced mead, am I planning on adding the ingredients in the primary or the secondary? So the primary side generally means you're adding it when the fermentation is most vigorous or it's most active. That's the start of the fermentation. Secondary is when it's still active, but less vigorous. So that means the bulk of the fermentation has occurred and then you add your fruit or your spice. For spices, I am a big proponent of adding them in the secondary whenever there isn't a lot of fermentation. And that's mostly to control the amount of flavor that you're getting within the spices in the brew. Spices can be finicky. Sometimes they really impart fast and if you were to leave a spice in for too long in the primary fermentation, it might overshadow everything that you had in your brew. Let's talk about some other things in this question. Sourcing fruits, there's a lot of ways to get fruits, including um, real fruit, obviously frozen fruit, purees. Uh, you can get these, um, they're like flavorings, but they're not really all that uh, real, I guess, is the better way to say it. Anywhere you can get fruit is great. I am a big proponent of just getting the fruit. And I know it seems silly, but some fruit's gonna be great for you. It's gonna be local. You might have mangoes local to you in a great fresh way. You might have to buy them frozen. Just depends on where you're at. So your ratios for fruit are also a factor as you're planning your recipe. Obviously each fruit's different. Some fruits are stronger than, than others. So I'm gonna give you a ballpark, but it's not necessarily true of every fruit. If you're wanting a light fruit mead, you're looking at like a pound to a pound and a half of fruit per gallon. If you're looking for like a regular fruited flavor mead, it's about one and a half to four pounds. And then if you want something that is like just a fruit bomb or no water, meaning it's all from fruit juice, you're gonna use anywhere from four to 12 pounds of fruit for that to occur. So that's a kind of ratio range you're gonna use. Your fruit, when added in the primary bulk of fermentation, will get more of a true, in my opinion, fruit character. This is because that yeast consumes the sugars that the fruit have, and then they're able to do their own process, they add, add their own characters, yeast characters based off that, because what they have. This also means though, because the fruit are fermented on, they're often uh, blasted when it comes to flavor, so sometimes you have to come back and add more fruit in the secondary when it's less vigorous to add flavor back. So as you're planning your recipe, maybe you split your fruit. You say, I'm gonna add half of it in the front, in the primary, half of it in the secondary. If you're just putting it in the secondary, you're gonna retain more of the fruit character and the sugars specifically. The aromatics from the fruit won't be uh, blasted away as much, so that's a pro. However, you do miss the culmination of what the yeast did with the fruit in the primary. So there's a pros and cons. The best way to do it, honestly, is just to split it half and half and you can get some great combos there. When you add your fruit and there's, if your yeast are still able to ferment post primary, that new fruit is just gonna start up fermentation again. So it's good to know, don't just add your fruit and assume, well, it's done, it might not be. So now we're on question four. This is talking about your spices specifically. Let's say our spiced meat is going along. We gotta ask ourselves, uh, you know, what role do I want the spices to play? Do I want them to, to be a predominant flavor or do I want them to be just a, a hint or a little bit of flavor in there? So my advice here is to add your spices and taste the mead often, meaning just go through, just get a little taste. Is that cinnamon stick you threw in there, is it really strong or is it still need some time? Is that clove you put in, is that uh, whatever, nutmeg, whatever thing you've added, taste the mead, just kind of see how it's going. It might be, perfectly fine and you might need more time or it might be super strong and it might be time to go ahead and rack it into a new container. Things like peppers, uh, like a chipotle pepper or a serrano, whatever, are really fun to add. Um, the capsaicin, which is the, the heat of the pepper, is the main thing we go for there. Depending on your pepper, you might end up with something that's more vegetal. I've had that happen before. I made a jalapeno mead and it turned out really vegetal tasting, more like a green bell pepper, more than the jalapeno that I intended. So just something to consider there. And when you're adding your spices, of course, high quality spices in really any form, whole, powder, 
whatever thing tincture if you've made something like that you could do those things so now we're talking about yeast question number five is what yeast do we need for our brew this is an important factor because yeast do impart flavor contrary to what people might say yeast do add flavor to a brew like we've talked about with the fruit a little bit so the internet's a great place to find out information if you're uh, curious about what a yeast is going to do specifically Look it up, Google it and say, hey, what does the uh, Lauben D47 do in a brew? I have a whole video where I took a traditional mead and split it out and did 20 different yeast with a traditional mead to see what kind of flavors we got. And I learned a lot about that. I'll link that video below. It's also in the notes. But that one helped me a lot. And I, of course, it's free to you. So that's talking about your yeast flavor profile. But let's talk about the other specs. For example, let's say you live in a um, hot climate. Knowing that, you need to find a yeast that can handle hotter fermentations. Let's say you're in a colder climate and you need something that can be a little bit lower. Find something that can go lower. Generally, though, you need to have your yeast's uh, temperature range understood. You know, what do I really need here for my fermentation to occur? What kind of yeast nutrient do I need and how much do I need to add? Uh, can they flocculate out, meaning fall to the bottom pretty quickly? What's the alcohol by volume cap? Am I trying to make this ginormous 14% mead, but my yeast only goes up to 12? Well, you're not gonna get up to 14%. That's my, my note there. So know those things, very important. Sometimes yeast can go past their cap. Sometimes they go, they don't go all the way to their cap. They're kind of finicky. Temperature control, as we just mentioned, super important. You have to have or pick a yeast that's gonna work well. Something like that Lauven D47 has a temperature range of 59 to 86. However, it's pretty widely known that most people ferment on the lower end of that D47 range, say like 64, rather than kick it up to 86. Other people do it hotter with varied results, but knowing what you're gonna do, knowing what your capabilities for controlling the temperature range is super helpful in your house. So speaking of yeast nutrient, let's say you know your yeast needs a just regular, normal amount of yeast nutrient. How do you add it? When do you add it? There are lots of ways to do this. There's lots of sources of nutrient for yeast, including dimonium phosphate, Fermade O, Fermade K. Um, we use yeast holes often. Those are just sources of yeast nutrient. When do we add them? Well, you can either add them up front in the beginning of the fermentation when you first mix your stuff up, or you can wait to add it over time. So like, we mostly do this based off our alcohol by volume. If I'm making something that's 6.5% ABV, I'm gonna go ahead and throw all of my yeast nutrient in the front. And I can find my yeast nutrient amount based off of like a calculator. Looking at my starting gravity, my yeast strain, it'll tell me. I have a calculator yeah, linked below you can use. So you find out how much nutrient you need, low ABV, add it all up front. Let's say I'm going 7.5% or higher. I'm gonna start to probably stagger my nutrient, meaning add part of it, like take, let's say, uh, all of my nutrients, split it into four parts, and I'm gonna add one part on day zero, and then another part on day two, and then another part on day three, and another on four. Pushing your yeast nutrient out over time helps the yeast ferment in a more healthy manner. So you can do that. I highly recommend to do that if you're making something that's higher ABV. Question seven. So we've gone through the beginning. We've kind of developed our ABV range. We've talked about our yeast. We've talked about our fruit, where we're going to get our fruit, where we're going to get our spices. How are we going to add those things in? Um, when are we going to add our yeast nutrient? all of those things, we're at the point where we have to also decide in this whole process, do we wanna make this a still or carbonated mead? Obviously, carbonated means bubbles. And still is no bubbles. So with that knowledge, we have to plan now what we're doing. And part of this rolls into your yeast capabilities and what you can do. If you're making a still mead, it's as simple as just letting it be. You don't have to worry about any carbonation steps you do have to worry about um, ensuring there's no more re-fermentation when you bottle it, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But let's pretend we're gonna carbonate. We got two options. You can bottle carbonate, or you can force carbonate, or keg carbonate. Bottle carbonation requires the yeast to still be active, or 
capable of consuming sugar. So know your starting gravity, not something we've talked about a bunch here, but it's a the number you get from a hydrometer. You measure that at the beginning before fermentation starts, and then after it's done, if you know your yeast cap, alcohol by volume cap, you can see, oh, they still have room to go. They can still ferment. So you can either do two things. Bottle carbonation would mean keeping those yeast alive. You're going to add a priming sugar, which is consumable by the yeast. If you want to back sweeten your brew, there is a step where you add non-fermentable sugar to back sweeten. Your priming sugar, which they can consume, and you bottle it. Yeast will consume the priming sugar, not the, uh, the non-fermentable, in that bottle. Spend about two weeks bottle carbonating, and then it'll be a bottle carbonated brew. I do have a video on how to do this, so you can also reference that with more specifics. So that sweetness level we talked about, use a non-fermentable sugar for back sweetening a bottle carbonated brew. You can't use a fermentable sugar because it will just get consumed by the yeast. So that's super important to know. I do also have uh, videos in reference to all of these things, so lots of links below. The forced carbonation method's different. It requires a kegging system with some CO2 access and stuff like that. It's kind of daunting at first, but it's really nice. When you do a carbonated brew, if you don't want to back sweeten it, then you literally just put it into the keg and you force carbonate it at 30 PSI for roughly you know two to three days, and then you bump it down to two to three PSI and it's serving pressure. That's basically ready to serve. If you want to back sweeten it, you wanna make sure that that yeast um, can't consume any more sugar or that you use a non-fermentable sugar. So you could use your non-fermentable to back sweeten, but more than likely you're gonna to want to back sweeten with honey. So you're gonna stabilize or pasteurize the brew. Stabilizing is the process of halting fermentation via uh, potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite in conjunction you can go ahead and add those into the brew, wait 24 hours, and add your fermentable sugar, like honey. You can also pasteurize, which is a process of heating the liquid up and in in killing off the yeast, essentially. Um, we'll talk about that more in a second. There's more times. Once you pasteurize, you can also take and back sweeten with honey. So that's different carbonation methods. Do you want to carbonate it? Follow some you know, rabbit hole there. If you don't want to carbonate it, skip on past that. Question eight, post-fermentation. Do I want my brew to be dry, semi-sweet, or sweet? So it's back to question one. We've talked about this. What can my yeast do? Um, if they're still able to ferment, then we need to figure out, well, I want non-fermentable sugar here so I don't cause any more re-fermentation on fermentable sugar. If they're not able to, to uh, ferment anymore, then you can add a fermentable sugar. We just talked about the stabilizing in um, portion, potassium sorbate, metabisulfite. That's a great option. I really like these. Generally speaking, I add about a half teaspoon of sorbate and 0.33 grams of metabisulfite per gallon of brew. It's really good to do this once you've um, racked the brew into a new container. You don't want to do this when the yeast are still caked at the bottom. So go ahead and rack the, the whole brew into a new container then stabilize, wait your 24 hours, and it's ready to, to back sweeten to your liking. Pasteurizing, as we talked about, is heating that liquid up. Here is a chart of the times and temps. You can do this in a sous vide. You can do this in um, a pot on your stove. You can do it in bottles. But here are your times. It's pretty easy to do. Um, I don't personally like to do it too much because it's a little more work than just sorbate and metabisulfite, but if you would like to do this, go for it. If your mead can't firm it anymore, just add that extra uh, back sweetening sugar and you're ready to go. The whole dry, semi-sweet, sweet category is kind of up to your taste buds. And I mean, it's just more sugar makes it more sweet. I feel like that's very obvious, but just add more sugar if you want it to be sweeter. With and the reasons of what we've talked about. All right, we're on question nine. So what other adjuncts or uh, extra things do I want to add to my brew? Any fermentable things will need to be ran through that whole pasteurizing or stabilizing stuff we just talked about. So if you don't want the fermentation to occur on that ingredient, make sure you halt the fermentation. If you don't care and it can ferment, then let it go. Let it, you know, let those whatever you added uh, be fermented on. 
People often add oak or woods to their brews. You can oak with oak chips, spirals, cubes, staves, barrels. Uh, they come in tons of different kinds of oak, like French, American, um, Hungarian. There's a bunch of different toast levels, light, there's medium, there's a heavy. It's all based on your opinion of what you think will work best for the brew. Something that's a light fruit, let's say like a pear, I'm probably not going to chunk a really heavy, dark toast Hungarian oak because it's going to contrast. I'm going to go a little lighter, a little more, I mean light in the profile. Each one of those is different and they take different amounts of time. So just look at your oak, see what you need to do, and how much you need to add, and then taste the brew often to know when you're ready to take it off of the oak. Another part is acid balance. This is that. Uh, this is the third leg we lean on for balancing a brew. We have sweetness, we have the sort of tannin or the, the mouthfeel body of it, and we have our acid. So the acid is, of course, exactly this. Does it have like a little bite? And if you balance these well, you make a really good brew. People often adjust acid with different uh, brewing acids like citric acid, malic acid, or tartaric. Or you can use lemon juice, lime juice, anything like that. Those often work well. Citric acids, what's found in like lemons, limes, oranges, those kind of citrusy fruits. Malic is found in apples, pears, peaches, blueberries, stuff like that. Tartaric is found in grapes and lots of berries. And you know, some of these fruits have a mixture of them. So it's not all predominantly one. Essentially, Acid balance is easy if you just use one of those ingredients like I talked about. The other one was tannin I mentioned, tannins, the mouthfeel. You can adjust this with uh, like powdered wine tannins, tannins, something like literal powdered wine tannin, you add some in. You can do this with oak, you can do this with a, a plethora of other things with sometimes tea can help. It's the body, the chew that you want from your brew. So balance those things between acid, tannin, sweetness. So we've made this mead, we're loving it. How long do we let it age before we drink it? This is kind of a hot topic question because lots of people um, have varying opinions. Some people say if it is 12%, don't drink it for two years. Some people say if it's 12%, it's okay to drink in two weeks. It's like all over the place. Most of it boils down to your opinion. Is it ready for you to drink? That's awesome. Um, it's kind of my opinion there. However, a general rule of thumb is the lower ABV brew it is, the quicker it can be drank. For example, a 7%. That thing could turn around and be ready in a month, a month and a half. An 18% mead is probably going to need more time because alcohol is super strong in those and it needs time to meld and kind of chill out. So that's, that's the range. Again, I have another video talking even more on how to you know, navigate that topic. One little important thing here is... Um, we're hearkening back to question five, which talks about our yeast and the yeast health. Yeast health is super important because if your yeast are unhealthy in fermentation, they'll kick off what we call fusels. Fusels are these off flavors or alcohols that kind of just throw your brew off and make it taste not very good. So healthy fermentations will lead you to a quicker drinking brew. Make sure you're feeding them well, the alcohol range, or excuse me, the temperature range is uh, good for them. The nutrients, like we just said, all of those things are super important. And we have our final question, question 11. We made this brew, you know, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit here, but clearing the mead. How long do you let it age slash clearing? Clearing it is the process of just making it look clearer. So uh, if you want your brew to be very visually appealing, you generally, generally want it to be clear. There are lots of ways to do this. You can let it age with time. That's also good, it works. It just takes a while. There are a bunch of different uh, clearing agents you can use that include stuff like sparkaloid, kisasol, enchitosan, bentonite, isinglass, gelatin. Those are just to name a few. Um, I've done a whole video testing them and uh, I have some of my favorites there. So you can check that video out as well. But those, Clearing agents, essentially, in a nutshell, each one of them is a little different. Some of them bind to the negative ions in the brew, and then they'll pull those out of suspension. And some bind to the positives and pull those out of suspension. The best ones are the ones that, that you know, have a, a charge that's negative that pull down the positives, and the positive pulls down to the negative. So everything, like, 
goes out. Everything gets to be collected at the bottom. And there are some clearing agents that do that. Again, this also happens with time, but it's just a long time to do so. You don't have to have a clear mead. At the end of the day, if you're okay with your mead, however it looks, that's great. Drink it how it is. A clear mead is generally more appealing for people though. So just keep that in mind. If you want to give your brew to a lot of people, you probably want it to look clear. So have I hit every topic you need to understand before you make your brew? No, there's, there's something I missed, I'm sure. But generally speaking, I feel like this is a pretty cohesive question list. These notes are below. And like I said, I have a flow chart. It doesn't quite go into detail like we did here, but it does give you the bullet points. If I'm doing this, where do I go? If I'm gonna make a fruit mead, where do I go from here? If you'd like to, to access that, download the PDF of it. It'll be in the description, of course. If you wanna buy a poster of it, I wish I had one right now to show you. Maybe if I get one figured out before this video uh, goes out, I can hold one up for you and show you what it looks like, but you can get one of those. Essentially, get the tools you need to be successful. I hope that I've helped you understand a little more about the mead making process. If you want to forego everything I've talked about today, just get a, a already pre-made recipe. You can find one on my channel. You can find them on my good friends like Doing the Most or Faywood Mead. Um, I would say we're the, the three people I trust the most for recipes because we've got a lot of experience underneath our belt. So find recipes from us if you want to do that as well. I'll put their channels down below. Those are my trusted friends. And those, those are the people I would put at the top of the food chain. I'm putting myself up there too. But at the top of the food chain for mead content and especially mead recipes. I can personally say this because I've tried their meads and they make great stuff. So I hope you have learned something. Let me know what you think. This has been a long video, but I hope it's been helpful. Maybe you've been listening while you've been driving. Whatever you've been doing, I hope it's helped. I'll see you in the future with another video. Go make some mead, ask yourself these 11 questions, and let me know how it goes. Cheers.